supplier, Carlitos Martinez, the manager of the technical area in LACNIC and Wesley Correa, who is very active in training his cre telecom uh, creator. And we have a Douglas Feature, network uh, engineer, San Telecom, Jaime Olmos, responsible for the operation center for um, IDC security in Guadalajara University in Mexico. So now I leave you with this excellent panel. I hope you enjoy it. And hopefully, if they don't answer everything that we want, you, you'll have time for questions. If not, we'll catch them in the break. There, thank you, Jorge. This is like a joke. A Mexican, a Brazilian, a, a, a Uruguayan, an Argentinian, and a bar, and they each ask for something. No, it was a joke. So the origin, this panel started with a simple question I asked Carlos, and then I thought that it would be good to have a, 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 an advisory job free of charge. Henry Godoy, are you there? He sent uh, a mail in our mailing list that was very interesting. He said that 50% of the internet traffic was IPv6. We can debate it later, but I said, ah, let's see what's happening in my network with IPv6. And unfortunately, the network of my company, we have all the stack. We give uh, IPv4 and IPv6 to our customers. We have the network absolutely supporting IPv6. I see, I notice the uh, uh, IPv6 so one bandwidth, and it was only 10%. 90% was IPv4. The customers range from all, uh, all, all the spectrum. So yeah, I asked Carlos, I said, Carlos, my boss will kill me. We have everything with IPv6. What am I doing wrong? That was the first question. And Carlos answered something there. It's super interesting what you said. So that was most interesting, Thomas. And it's good that we managed to bring together this panel. When Thomas told me about this, I said, what you are doing, in fact, is to giving virtual machines to your clients and you're applying dual stack to those machines. Now, what are your clients putting into the DNS? And Thomas said, well, I don't know. He doesn't know. He just provides infrastructure. So I asked him, if your customers don't put the 4A register in the DNS so that all the rest of the world knows that they have IPv6, they'll never get to find out. The world will never know that they have IPv6, so they'll never receive anything. And in the same way, if you don't put register A, you won't get IPv4 traffic. The same thing happens there. So when we think about it, it's not magic. It's not that you have telepathy between users and services and say, I'm going to close my eyes and the server will convey me through the infra space what IP address it has. So I don't, if I don't publish it in the DNS, the world never find out. So that is where all this conversation began that ended up in this panel. Well, precisely, Douglas and Wesley and myself had submitted three similar papers, Wesley and Douglas's were great, and I asked them whether we could organize this panel. So we also invited Jaime, and Jaime, the second question is for you, Jaime. Do you see or did you, or did, or do you see or did you see this problem in the university? What's the problem with IP4 and IP6? I'm going to tell you about different scenarios that we have observed. I can say for over 20 years now. In Mexico, together with the Autonomous University, UNAM, we have pioneered the deployment. And when we managed precisely to transition so that the ISP could provide IPv6 service, we realized that that situation was happening. We had a generalized deployment, but this did not reflect the deployment we did, in fact, have. And even when we 
began to do the monitoring part, that is when we realized this is one of the challenges that we had that we hadn't observed. We monitor the bandwidth of the truncal bandwidth to the ISP side, but we didn't discriminate how much traffic went from one to the other. So this led us to observe that something was happening there. And I want to take this opportunity because this is something we have been experimenting with. Maybe not all of you are aware, but in Mexico, since September 2021, the federal government launched through the constitutional reform the fact that all government agencies have to have IPv6 as from 2024. So we're already beyond that date, and we have come across situations where these government agencies did not have an autonomous system. This reform forces them to have an autonomous system. So we have a problem behind all this because they didn't have their own resources. So, so far, we continue helping many of these because they are afraid of turning on IPv6. So there's an issue regarding capacity building. A group of people embarked on the task of providing support, but we don't have sufficient people. If, as you know, Mexico had a change in government in administration, like the United States, we continue to providing support to the agency so that can bring about this transition. So we have a technical aspect, and then we have the fear of turning on these services. W these education institutions that we support, we haven't managed to make them turn this part on. They have to turn on these services because they have many doubts as to how to proceed. So this is quite a challenge, but I think that gradually in Mexico, we're progressing, and I think we have 50% deployment nationally. And this is also thanks to Telmex. Allow me to reinforce what Jaime was saying. I'm convinced that many of the green squares you saw in Sylvia's dashboard are errors. Not an error of the street, but it is people that enabled IPv6. I never learned that they had enabled IPv6 because it comes by default in Cloudflare, for example. I'm sure that there are many more cases such as those other than those. I imagine that we cannot only blame the DNS. This is a panel called IPv6 Death by DNS. But Wesley, what else must we also bear in mind? Which were the two most common errors when implementing an IPv6 network? I think that an IPv6 implementation basically is a project. This is no. so the first thing when you plan to go on a diet, you have to have a support network. So the family has to support you. Your wife, your family have to support you with physical exercise. And the same happens with IPv6 implementation. Maybe a network engineer from an you can say, I'm going to implement IPv6, and this is going to happen on its own. But this is not the case. You depend how to raise the awareness of the secretary, of the experts, of the people in charge of installing things, of IPv4 in the browser to see if IPv6 works. You have to educate all those people who, if looking at a site and IPv6 is not working on the site, well, to notify this. I recall that nine or ten years ago at my company, I was called Mr. IPv6 because I really fed everyone up. Uh, so ping, trace out, test IPv6, take screenshots. I want all the subscribers to have IPv6 enabled and demonstrated. So much of that is lost, the essence of experiencing IPv6. And it should be an IPv6 FE80 address. <laughs> Douglas, what else can help our IPv6 network that is already implemented to have even more IPv6 traffic? Before answering that question, I would like to separate things. This is because of the niches we work on. 
some time ago we said that the IPv6 uh, deployment was in the CPs, but today we can say that this is only a problem for those who don't purchase the appropriate equipment. It's not that IPv6 hasn't been properly deployed, but the thing is you have to choose your equipment properly. The same happens with the content providers. There are content providers that have the capacity to deliver 100% to IPv6. And now we realized of another problem which answers your question. The point is that we have to take into account the rules of the business. For example, Facebook has IPv6 only in its entire network, but it still has to maintain business rules for IPv4. The same happens to an ISP that has IPv4 and IPv6. They have to maintain the business rules for both IPv4 and IPv6. What does this mean? They have to maintain tracking of the addresses assigned to their customers. And the same thing happens to an e-commerce business that has to maintain IPv4 and IPv6 tracking for those who did purchases and you read the credit cards. So I think that right now that is the biggest gap we have in order to make progress. Uh, Cloud company does hosting for a lot of e-commerce. They put install or they, but the plugins for deploying the payment gateway only support IPv4 and the same for tracking. So I disable IPv6 and that is what they do. That is the biggest problem we face right now. We had the first phase, uh, the first battle of our war was with the CPEs, and now fighting with the content providers, and now the next problem are the web services developers. So that would be the next battle over the coming five years, I think. That reminds me of something. I cannot mention the name. That reminds me of an online gaming client who said no. No, no, IPv4, no. We can solution, solve this with IPv6, no. They wanted to have IPv4. I couldn't ask further because that was a client. Jaime. Now, listening to what Douglas has just said and the support issues mentioned by Wesley. What were the major difficulties you encountered when deploying IPv6 only? Particularly, what did you realize right away after the deployment? What was happening? Among the many things that I can refer to, and that's why I didn't bring my computer, but Speaking about things in the past, the support, particularly of those ap security applications of hardware. Today we have an XDR. I'm not going to mention the brand. This XDR is helping us very much. This is with machine learning that controls our cybersecurity team. But it doesn't support IPv6, and this is something we are fighting for. And this is no minor company. This is a company that hasn't managed to incorporate IPv6. And ironically enough, I think that the least, the voice over IP in IPv6 was worked very well. And this was a vendor that we use for testing, and this is sold as part of the features of that product. But in the case 
of our data center agents. This has been very difficult to implement. This has been one of the main difficulties we have. We have quite a big turnover in our personnel. Whenever someone changes in the enterprise, that person is becomes very valuable in the market. So the person learns in the company, and once the person becomes stable, they leave the company. So I'm one of the few persons who have endured in the university just for the love of art. And somehow we have managed to figure out other mechanisms to feed the technical community in our university. We are the second largest university in the country with 300,000 students. And it's not so easy to have such a limited amount of personnel. So that has led to the difficulty of turning off IPv6. But with the turnover of that personnel, no follow-up is done. And services are decentralized. So they see IPv6, they say see IPv6 and turn the machine off. And this has fluctuated. And the chain challenges we face is finding capacity building mechanisms. I also teach at private universities in the country and the curricula in the country don't include IPv6. And that's one of the difficulties that I perceive is very serious in our region, namely that students are learning with knowledge on networks that will no longer be enforced in the coming years. Well, I heard the same thing from Henry, that the curriculum universities are not including IPv6. And like Silvio was saying, if we register a university at a university, we're registering to study at universities to learn about networks and communications and using protocols of the past century. So this is something that I say, but it's not only myself. We have to evangelize in IPv6 and also in automating processes. We are getting prepared with traditional networks, but we really have to take this to software-defined networks. And these students have to really learn about what is happening in the market. I would go on with that, on and on, but tomorrow there is a panel with the industry, right? So I invite you all, and we'll touch upon those topics. Yes. It's it's easier to write the book on IPv4 than IPv6, but uh, yes, that's the way it is. Well, the books were written many years ago, and it's the same. Are you happy with IPv6? If you had to put a smiling face or a sad face, well, personally, I think that IPv6 has to be absolutely transparent in Mexico. I can say that there are many non-technical people that don't even know that they have IPv6, and people are happy because of the, the, ben, the service has benefited. I always thought, I always heard those, uh, we, those, um, the Volkswagen, uh, the uh, Beetle, uh, they work very well in Guadalajara. But uh, the Formula One don't work in uh, Guadalajara. And, but today, we see a better efficiency, and users don't notice it. But uh, the service becomes more stable. And for, f for about five years, a bit more, we had uh, an IP depletion. So we were forced uh, to have a transition, although we've worked on the topic for over 20 years, unless uh, uh, we, we we can't afford anybody, uh, we can't force anybody. We, we tell them what the best practices are, but uh, we can't force them, so we can't have 100% uh, deployment. So we, we need to help uh, the organizations in uh, their uh, learning curve because we we had to assist uh, many government agencies that uh, find it very hard to change their mindset to adopt uh, IPv6. So they want and they want they think that uh, uh, and because there are a lot of myths.
or deploying an IPv6 network with an IPv4 mentality. That's the worst thing you can do. Having uh, an IPv4 mentality and using IPv6. Douglas, the same question as Jaime, not about how happy you are. Well, it could be how happy you are with IPv6. But what did you realize after deploying IPv6, apart from the fact, the fact that uh, the uh, clients were turning it off? Well, we have multiple faces. One is angry, another one is happy, then happy again, then crying. It goes up and down. So what uh, I what uh, I don't like about it is our colleagues that the network operators that are just happy disabling the IPv6 as a solution. And with this, I go back to what I said earlier. For instance, companies that develop games that guide their users to disable IPv6 as a form to, to deactivate. Uh, this is what uh, makes me sad, very sad. Because actually the problem is not uh, as I, well, because IPv4 also has problems in its uh, operations chain and IPv6 also has problems. So sometimes when you disable IPv4, then IPv6 will work, but they are used to, they, they feel more reassured if they use IPv4, and that makes me sad. But at the same time, there are things like that make me happy, such as knowing that many ISPs use IPv6 as a way out to uh, escape from uh, the DDO attacks, uh, the, deni the denial of service uh, attacks, because most such attacks uh, are through IPv4. So that makes me happy. Excellent. Wesley. Uh, your customers, of course, they are happy because they have you as a, an advisor. You are an excellent uh, professional. Now, when they have the deployment of IPv6 in their networks, what are the things they realize? Do they realize that the network is any better? What do clients tell you when they have IPv6 in their networks? Well, my students, my clients usually go through four stages. The first stage is ecstasy. They are absolutely excited because they have IPv6 and they do marketing and they talk to their friends, uh, their uncles, and they tell, let everybody know that, well, yes, now we are using the new protocol. And But then after that, it, uh, it, they say, well, yes, I have IPv6 and that improves my latency, my experience, my browsing. Uh, experiencing, I can carry longer packets, uh, I have a better service experience. So they reach that phase that is understanding. The next phase is accommodation, and that's what worries me. It frightens me, because when they get to that phase, IPv6 is no longer a novelty. It no longer represents any change. They enter a sort of uh, of a delay and they no longer implement IPv6 in the user. They open another site in IPv4 because they forgot to implement IP, the IPv6 block in that uh, site. And they say, well, I leave it for later when I have time. So the network will stay for one or two years with, with IPv4 only because it, uh, well, of course, they are offering the internet and it, they are providing service only with IPv4 only, even if it's not the right thing. So this is a step that really frightens me. And the last is, uh, uh, is, uh, the, is when I say, well, yes, now did I did my job as an IPv6 evangelist. It's the maturation maturity. And when they reach this maturity is when the client or the student starts to evangelize IPv6, where in the company or in the business, uh, 
uh, um, that, that person will say, you know how important IPv6 is. We don't know where people come from, if they came from a university where they didn't learn anything about IPv6, or if they co work in a company the, that are still in the last century, training those people, putting them in the company's uh, corporate um, uh, when, when, the, when the student comes at this stage, then I consider that my activity is concluded. Excellent. I love those stages. And, uh, and especially forgetting, not including, not to, not to inc put, uh, implement IPv6 in the process. Yeah, so they miss it. Carlos. Unfortunately, to maintain the networks today, what Sylvia was saying about our clients having that uh, dual stack, although you can work with uh, IPv6 only, but they are still dual stack. The companies buy IP addresses. The RRs don't have any uh, left, uh, we all know that. Uh, can it be that uh, at a certain time there will be no no IPv4 addresses to buy? That's interesting. Some time ago, uh, an acquaintance compared the purchase of IPv4 uh, addresses and uh, the uh, Bitcoin mining. Uh, that, of course, it's an asset, but there is a limited uh, supply. And in a way, what we are doing now is to do the hunger game. Through market mechanisms, we are reaccommodating IPv4 bit pieces from one side to the other. And uh, with market uh, rationales, and that works to a certain extent. But sooner or later, one of the two things may happen. Or they will. It will be impossible to reaccommodate uh, those pieces any longer. So the price of IPv4 will be just soaring. Or what may happen is that there may be an interesting cycle where there may be bits and pieces of IPv4 somewhere, and uh, the price starts uh, going down when people start implementing more IPv6. The economists study this to see the projections of the different markets, whether it will fail or get saturated or whatever. And I think that with the IPv4 market, uh, curiously enough, I have no idea where it will go. Now, I wanted to make a few comments about something that my colleague said the issue of hunger games. Do you remember when you had to promote IPv4 networks with a slash uh, 24 and you cut them into slash 28s and you counted how many machines you were in uh, going to connect in each VLAN? Well, one of the things that make me happier about IPv6 is that you can forget about it. You'll never run out of uh, IPv6. Uh, um, it, so you can think. Uh, you'll think of uh, network design uh, from another point of view. And it is true, as some of you said, that sometimes you design networks as if they were IPv4, looking for the, the smallest prefixes possible and things like that. And that is uh, cumbersome uh, to exercise um, the way of thinking to make the most of IPv6. So I recognize Jordi, who always did his best, saying that we uh, shouldn't, uh, uh, that we we do, shouldn't care about the size of the prefix, and and uh, because that leads to a great uh, ease in uh, deploying uh, IPv6. Yes, and here we have uh, Ian Short. I don't remember the name, number of uh, RIPE, the best practice. What prefixes to assign? Don't give your client a slash 128, but a slash 56 for prefix delegation. What's, what's happening, Jordi? Let us know. Tell us. Yes, precisely related to what many of you have said. You have to unlearn IPv4 to learn about IPv6. Yes, definitely. Do you agree, Douglas? We should forget about IPv4 and learn about IPv6. I don't know whether we should unlearn IPv4, but we need to understand that it's a different thing. So 
I didn't go through that, but some people here went through the talking ring change to uh, IPv4. It's it's a different thing. Uh, please don't point at anybody. My parents told me about it. My granddaddy. Well, it's it, you can compare that. Uh, so. Uh, it's a, you don't try to use the old techniques uh, because it won't work. So, and here comes the million dollar question. We are going to start with Wesley as his, uh, the, uh, our host, and then, then uh, uh, we'll go from country to country. It's how many countries, how many Amer uh, America Cups uh, the countries won, Mexico, Argentina, and Uruguay. He, there we have Juan Carlos Werger. Before you drop that topic, let me add something. I listened this from some operator, not a large one, but I've heard it. As you're going to implement I'm Wecker speaking for myself. I, I have heard from some operator, and when you say it, there are many, many people that will repeat it and even believe it, so it would be good to demystify this, as this is very good and IPv6 uh, traffic is growing. Then there's going to be many people that are going to be Im implement IPv6, and that will manage IPv4, so I'm going to cross my arms waiting for IPv4 to appear, and that's, I won't have to do anything. May I uh, make a comment about that? Well, it's the same as if I said, well, now they're using the fax modem, so let's wait until the facsimiles are uh, free so that, I can, so that I can use them. No, it's like doing that. When did you receive the command that you should quit using facsimiles at home? Never, but we are no longer using them. Ian? Uh, connect. Uh, the document that you mentioned about the, the prefix sizes and the assignment, uh, it's called RIPE 690. It's quite an old document and sadly still valid and current because the ITF didn't do anything to fix the problems that are documented in, 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 in that document. So uh, the advice is still slash 56 or slash 48 and do it as static as possible. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you very much, Jan. Ah, la pregunta del millón. Ah, the million dollar question that I didn't get to ask. What do you think will arrive first? Let's start with Wesley, Jaime, Douglas, and Carlos. What will come first, the day in which Uruguay will really wins a World Cup, and this is not 100 years ago, or when machines rebel like Terminator, or when internet traffic reaches 100% IPv6? That's a difficult question. Although I'm not an addict to soccer, I see Uruguay is playing great matches. They have about 20 nurses. So if we add AI to the machines, it is not unlikely. We see dogs, robot dogs that walk and monitor. They only need to bark. Uh, may they have IPv4? Well, maybe, yes, they have IPv4. No doubt at all about that. Well, I would like to say that IPv6 will reach almost 90% because, in fact, many operators are seeing the need to do so. They are working this, some at a slower pace compared to others, others in a more disorganized way. We have seen major operators in medium and large countries that don't follow best practices. They deliver slash 64 only to a home 
connection, uh, and that shouldn't happen. I have no words to express how what I feel when I see situations such as those. Or even worse, you have operators who didn't even take care to start. But I want to firmly believe that IPv6 will reach 90 to 100 percent before Uruguay wins the World Cup, even though they play great, play great matches, and before machines rebel. Jaime. I would really place my bets, and I think I see the example is our country. You might recall that before 2017, Mexico didn't stand out for its deployment, and we're all aware that they ran out of resources. And we see that there is a growth, at least in APNIX, there is a radical growth. It really ro skyrocketed. It began to be one of the countries that are spearheading deployment. So as we have mentioned in several cases, it is the exhaustion of IP4 addresses that had led us to this situation. And then I insist on the education aspect. We have been speaking with some of the government agencies that are changing things, and they came up with an idea that has to do with what are our obligations, namely to, the obligation is to convey the relevance of understanding the protocol. And this is a major government agency. They were asking for a slash 48 because they have to do divisions after 64. So that is a mission. So it's IPv4 mindset. There are, there are many, many addresses. So I'm going to get a 64 and I'm going to divide it. And on the other hand, you have the smaller agencies that are not aware that to use BGP because they don't have knowledge on BGP is that 48 is a minimum that they could announce. So they ask for a 48 when they have several campuses distributed throughout the country. And they say it's too many addresses and I need to have this amount. But you won't be able to announce these. You have an autonomous system. You're going to begin with a procedure again. So if you don't do proper planning, you'll have to throw all those things away. However, the point is that they have to make progress. They have to have a deliverable. So hopefully the deliverable of, deliverable of those institution is to comply. But they do it, but it doesn't make progress. So before I answer that question seriously, let's speak about Uruguay. I would say the same for Brazilians. At the same moments where Palmeiras had its own World, Cl World Cup between clubs, and the same Uruguay will have its own World Cup. But nevertheless, regarding 100% deployment, sincerely, we won't live to see that. Why do I say that? Because not that long ago, maybe 20 years ago, maybe less, eight years ago, I provided support to a clinical lab and the communication of one equipment with its controller was still in Apple Talk. Uh, it was from the probe connection to a Mac machine. E. And from now in 20 years' time, we're going to see the same with IPv6 and IPv4 happening in the machines that have been somehow forgotten. But more than 95, more than 98 percent, maybe. But the truth is that the most sensitive organ of the body, it's not the brain, it's not the heart, it's not the lung, it's the pocket. It's our purses. That's the most sensitive part of the human body. So. It occurs that the ISPs now understand that IPv4 is expensive, not because of purchasing this, but you have to purchase $100,000 equipment to do CGNAT. They have to purchase a device that to do the long prefix match in the chips is far more expensive compared to the other.
option. So a poor choice makes the protocol more expensive in other aspects. So what I think is that from now in, what, 10 years' time, well, when we reach that percentage, this is when the companies start, the payment gateways start to purchase more because the hosting is more expensive for them to host IPv4. So if the query comes from IPv4, it will be more expensive. If it comes from IPv6, that will be a case. So at that moment, you will have a cataclysm of changes to IPv6. Well, I think Amazon is now ch charging more for that. Yes, uh, API calls to IPv4 endpoints are more expensive compared to IPv6. Quite impressive. But I think that the defining fact, uh, and something else I forgot. I am, um, and I mentioned this already, I am absolutely anti-piracy. But unfortunately, we must admit that the piracy TVs are going to do more deployment in IPv6 than what we did in the past 10 years. Because from what I've heard, the piracy TV software vendors are recommending enabling IPv6. Quite the opposite of what was happening two years ago. They recommend enabling IPv6 so that the TV box, the Pi TV boxes, can be done to peer to peer to broadcast things. You know, like in the past with the torrents. So this will be like a catalysis, like a catalyst. But this will happen whether you like it or not. I hope my comment fits into the code of contact. But this was what happened with the adult websites with the credit cards. Thanks to that quote unquote industry, all the credit cards in the internet payments were accepted. Yes, precisely. Carlos, the million dollar question, 100% IPv6. I think we'll never reach IPv6 100%, and I agree with Douglas, and I have a similar story to share with you. Some years ago, I was asked to analyze, analyze some TCP dumps from a major Ethernet, quite a big one, and you had anything there, things that shouldn't exist at all. You had IPXs, and he had SNA. I had never seen SNA outside the manuals of the Cisco speeches. So there are things that resist dying, and I think IPv4 is on that path. But reasonably, I would say 99% or 90%, and this will occur even before Uruguay wins the World Cup, and I say that with great pain as a Uruguayan. But seriously speaking, there's a 99% threshold that we can state and declare victory. I think the time will come when we reach that threshold. And there are two things. What Douglas said is very much so. Uh, money plays a major role. And there's another point. The network operators or the carrier networks have to maintain two networks, one in IPv4 and one in IPv6, that share most of layer two. At some moment, the large share of income comes from one of these services. Now, if the large share comes from the IPv6 service, then the decisions of what to maintain better and what to operate better will change. Thank you. Before we close the panel, we have time to uh, have for two questions from the floor. Junior, did you stand up? Yes, yes, I did. Uh, increased latency for using IP4. I disagree with Douglas. 
because in my opinion, our battle is not against the software developers, not even with the developers of whatever thing, because developers need uh, very an FTN, uh, one that responds to IP4 or IP6. There is not an issue. Our battle is against the network operators. We are here gathered with many network operators of the major enterprises from Latin America. But when we speak about smaller networks, we still have many issues with IPv6. I can give you an example. We have many clients in Chile, and our customer in Chile is an ITP that provides transit to many customers in Chile, more than 50% of the transit customers. I mean, don't even ask for IPv6 for a VGP session. So if we ask them, please, VGP is and IPv6 is still low, you won't be able to pick up the session with IPv6. No, I don't use it. That's what they answer. So that is an ACN that has its IPv4 and its IPv6, but they don't even have one single IPv6 session in for BGP. So what the point is that the problem are the network operators, that's a point. And also the operators of the corporate networks, which is not an ISP network, but these are major uh, networks. I come from a company uh, with about five or 6,000 computers, and we didn't even have one single IPv6. I spoke to everyone and said, let's put IPv6 here, and they said, no, my kids, my grandkids are not interested in IPv6. So the major problem we have are the network operators. It's not the software developers, because we are those who have to make IPv6 work. We really have to make IPv6 work everywhere. We have to enforce it somehow. Thank you, Junior. I would like to make a comment on that point. BGP is also like a provocation at LACNIC and also at LACNOG. I mentioned something some time ago with you regarding something that LACNIC is lacking and that RIPE does this already. These are the TCPs. These are official recommendations. So if everything turns out well, we'll have this. But these are like best practices, BGP sessions are established exclusively on IPv6 and for routing IPv4 packets. That would be one of the ways to drive the adoption of IPv6 for those who don't wish to do so. So this might be an adequate moment to do so. So from now on, because our mother uh, we are educating, says that the best thing is to do this or that. So from now on, the best thing is to do BGP session established on IPv6, routing through this uh, same uh, hopper, IPv4. That would be a good thing. So thank you, Jaime, Douglas, Wesley, Carlos. Thank you for having participated in this debate. And I invite you to break, Jorge, and a round of applause for the panelists. George. Tengo. Sí, ahora sí tengo. Qué bueno. Well, first of all, I want to thank the 
this excellent panel. I think that the afternoon was very motivating, first with Sylvia's uh, lecture and then with this panel. And after the break, we are going to have uh, the experience of Henry Alves Godoy on IPv6 too, and then we're going to go on with other topics of great interest. So please, let's have a very short break, about 15 minutes, and we'll start again at 4.30 because we are a bit late in the program. So please be back at 4.30 so that we can get started at 4.30 sharp. <laughs> 